Hey, hey, we're back at the Case IH stage. We got another show coming up. How's everybody doing? Like, you can really answer and I'd hear it, but hey, that's good. Uh, I've been on a diet, had to go on a third one to get enough to eat. <laughs> and uh, I went on a Slim Fast diet. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but apparently it doesn't work when you put ice cream in the shakes. So I started putting Jim Bean in it. I didn't get fat. I mean, I didn't care. I was drinking a Slim Jim. But that's what I was. All right, some of these are just for me, and I just totally screwed that up. Um, but welcome to the Case IH booth. We, we are friendly, knowledgeable. These tractors are made by farmers, so if you have any questions, ask them. Lots of times they've already driven it. They know about it. And we are also funny here at Case IH. This is a joke that one of the employees told me. It's, uh, why do cows have hooves? Because they lack toes. <laughs> Boom, I'm done. Thank you. That's good. That's good. There was a new scientific study out that said that cow farts are depleting the ozone layer. Can you, if you've heard about this. So apparently some guy went out to a field with a full of cows and went, yep, climate change. You know what I'm saying? So, so the authorities decided the way to fix this was to start a methane tax. They're going to tax every farm in America on the amount of methane that's coming off of it. Well, my first question is, I hope it's just for the animals. Because my granny's going to put me out of business. Oh, that's all I'm saying. But now I need to know which cows are breaking wind for tax purposes. And I ask them, and I got 400 cows going, wouldn't me. And the cows, like, when they find out they can't break wind anymore, how long before they quit making milk? Because they can't do, they can't hold one in and make milk. Like, I've been in church before trying to hold one in, all right? I can't even concentrate on the preacher. So if the cows are holding in, how long for one of them just pops? You know, it's going to take out the whole rest of the herd. So what I started doing was I started taking baby powder, and I put it on all my cows' rear ends. I'm like, pfft, 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 pfft. I have a lot of cows. So... And then I sit in a tower and I wait for the <laughs> like last week in Florida, my little nephew's like, look, Uncle Tim, it's snowing, you know, and he's making angels in the fart dust and just. Thank you for putting up with that. Are you ready for some intelligent people to come up here and talk? I, I wasn't even supposed to be here. I was out there picking up cigarette butts and like, hey, you want to come talk to these people? And I was like, yes, as long as it counts as my part of my community service. So I need the hours. All right. We're going to talk about. We're going to talk about smart stuff. Dr. Allison, Lily, and Chris, and I'll let you go from there. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Those are real knee slappers. Appreciate that. Those are great. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Larson. I'm the Tillage Marketing Manager with Case IH. Uh, I hail from uh, Northeast Iowa, where uh, I also farm there. You've probably seen our campaign a little bit there on Built by Farmers. I am one of those. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that farm a little bit today, uh, as well as some of the research that we do at Case IH to uh, prove out our products. And with me today are two of our research agronomists. They're on staff and, uh, and work with our products every day, uh, evaluating them and making sure that they achieve what we want as far as an agronomic output for all of our tillage tools. So ladies, please introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm Dr. Allison Bryan, and I'm the tillage research agronomist, and I'm from Illinois, and I did all my schooling in Illinois. I went to Illinois State, and I studied crop and soil science, and then I went to the University of Illinois, and I um, studied crop sciences, really focusing on high-yielding corn and soybean systems, crop rotation, and managing crop residue, which led me nicely into the soil management role. Yes, and then I am Lily Kobo. I am the planter research agronomist, and I am also from Illinois. I went to Iowa State University for my bachelor's degree, go Cyclones. Um, and then I went to uh, Northern Illinois University for my master's degree, where I focused on cover crops and the integration of them into row, row systems, um, and then just soil health in general. Yeah, and I am the least educated person on this stage. <laughs> Woo, that's hard to... Hard to come by. That's incredible. We, we really appreciate all the work these ladies do. And we're going to today show you three kind of research, uh, field scale research projects that we worked on uh, uh, on our tools to help understand a lot more about seedbed quality, how it influences planters, and uh, and, and really complementing seeds. The, the, uh, the, the, the key thing that we're always watching at Case IH is complementing seed placement. It's so critical. We know how vital that is to getting a good start with that seed. 
and how seedbed affects that uh, is one of the research projects that we did uh, throughout this last year. Technology uh, is, is, is the really final frontier of technology is the soil management product. And that ROI and, and trying to understand where that fits in soil management is, is another piece of research that we did this year to help you know, really prove out the need for, for technology. And I think we found that and have also even gone further into prescriptive type technology, things that are almost out there. You, 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 you got to go to the moon here to think of these sorts of things, but really bringing prescriptions now into soil management. You're going to treat each individual part of your field differently. So uh, those are the three things we're going to talk about really over the next 25 to 30 minutes. And uh, I'm going to let Allison kind of kick off this first one and help understand a lot more about seed bed and how it affects planter performance. Yeah. So we're going to focus in on that first research study and what we were doing there. We were looking at the interaction between that seed bed, that seed bed quality, and then the plant, some planter settings. So first what we did is we were trying to create two extremes. We wanted to have a good quality seed bed against an extreme of a very bad, poor quality seed bed. So what we did to create those two very different scenarios is we took our 335 VT and we set it properly and improperly. And so when we were setting it properly, we had it level and it was consistent throughout and it was running at two and a half inch depth. And then back here on this, this rear attachment, we were applying pressure, 90 pounds per foot. And so with that, we were trying to level things out and, and make sure we're getting those clods sized. So that was for the good quality. Everything was set properly. And then for the poor seedbed quality in the improperly set, we actually had the nose down. And so that means that it just wasn't a consistent depth across the tool. And so although we were targeting two and a half inch depth, it was actually running at some points of the machine at four inches of depth. So there wasn't consistency there. And then our, um, that rear attachment, we didn't have any pressure. So it wasn't leveling things out. So we had two very um, different, and we'll, we'll be able to show you what that looked like. And then as far as the planter side of things, for this particular plot, we used our 2150 early riser with a 16 row, 30 inch row spacing configuration. Uh, so that's one of our front fold planters. And um, we targeted a two inch planting depth, a 35,000 um, seed per acre population, uh, ran about six miles per hour for the whole thing. And the important thing here is that uh, this machine was equipped with uh, shark tooth yetter residue managers. And we ran those at two different settings. So one would have been at full lift, so no interaction between the soil and the residue. And then we also had it engaged and that would have been down at 30 PSI. Yeah, you bet. And I guess from a farmer perspective, as I look at these plots and the things that we did here and going out and setting a lot of tools for, for customers and, and being in the field with our products, these are kind of real live events where, where we may have even struggle uh, with getting things set correctly. And, uh, and some of the influences and what that happens or what happens with those settings. So Allison, what did the actual seabed end up you know, really looking like? And I think we have some, some examples here of what, what we end up with, uh, with poor versus mm -hmm. ideal settings. Yes, and so we like to get out there and get dirty and we actually are assessing the output, right? We wanna actually see, okay, we set things in properly, uh, what what actually happened? So, for example, we look at clod size distribution. So we've got we've got our balls here, and we we actually are looking at one to two inch, or two to three and a half, or the three and a half or larger. Okay, so we've got these different clod sizes, and so you kind of want to uh, get away from this if you want to have a good seed bed quality and lean more towards that golf ball size. So we want um, lots of these. Yeah. Not lots of these. Okay, right? and so mm -hmm. we, we're out there and we're counting. And, um, and from our, our sample size, on average, what we were seeing on the surface is that, oh, got to go to the next slide. Here you go, is this. This is actually what we were visually seeing in the field. And on average, we were seeing that there were 14 clods that were this size or larger in that poor seabed quality that we created. And then for the good seed bed, we were seeing on average five. And then to take that a step further, we even looked at clods that were six inches or larger in this particular situation. And I don't have a ball that's big enough for that. But what we saw was with that good seed bed, we had none that were six inches. Okay, we didn't have any of that. Um, and then with this over here, we had half of them that were six inches. So we definitely created a very poor seed bed. 
And so we wanted to see how these two different conditions would impact our planter performance. And so for that, we looked at two different metrics. We have our ground contact that we looked at and then also our ride quality. And so ground, con ground contact is a measure of, is there weight on those gauge wheels? Are you reading, reaching that target depth that you have set? Um, and then ride quality is a measure of the vertical movement of your row unit. So essentially how bouncy is it as you go across the field? And so what we found actually, as you went from a poor tillage quality condition to an ideal tillage quality condition was that our ground contact increased by uh, 2% and our ride quality increased by 6%. And so the tillage quality is really setting the stage for your planter performance. All right, so that's a little bit about what the soil conditions look like. And, and I would say from a farmer perspective, you know, if I saw that, I'm going to be probably doing something about it. But we continued to plant into it just to see what it would do. Now, what does the uh, what do the plants kind of look like as they started to emerge? And because uh, you you kept going back to the field, we didn't just leave it here. You can't. You guys just don't leave things. We like alone. we like to get out there, yeah. and uh, we like you know we count clods, so you might as well count plants too. So we're also checking those out in season. So this was from those particular that particular field where we put out these different treatments, and this is what we were seeing in the the very cloddy condition that we created that poor seabed. We saw clods that were very large, three and a half inches or greater, and this this is an example where we saw. Although these are very similar in growth stage, you can actually see that this plant is no longer vertical. It's laying on its side. It actually has a clod that is, you know, physically weighing down on it. So it's going to be wasting energy, expending that energy to get to get past this. So it's literally has it's weighing down the yield trajectory of this particular plant. So that's one of the first examples of what we were seeing. Oh, I got to change the slide. <laughs> uh, so for the second image, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about seed to soil contact. Um, you can see this plant on the very left hand side would be a representative plant for this field. So um, this is what you would expect most of the plants here, uh, the growth stage that they would be at. But what you can see uh, directly neighboring that plant, we actually have one that's uh, one leaf stage behind and a plant that's two leaf stages behind. And again, this is in our poor tillage quality conditions, right? You can see that it's rough. We've got clods, potentially residue that's not being managed correctly. Um, and so you're going to end up having a lot of uh, gaps and voids around that seed that you place in the furrow. Uh, and so this is going to cause issues such as um, moisture absorption. It's probably going to be slower. It's going to be non-uniform. Um, and you'll see similar issues with temperature, right? Because as we know, soil and air actually heat up at different rates, right? So you're going to have different temperatures around those seeds. And so unfortunately, what you're going to see is exactly what you see in this image, right? So you're going to have an uneven stand. Um, and actually, to take it to a little bit more of an extreme situation, you can see um, uh, over here, it looks like there's a gap where potentially a plant should be. Um, and it's likely that there was a seed placed there, but that due to the conditions, it just did not emerge at all. It actually... Um with our Case IH research, we actually went out into, uh, we have previous research where we went out about this growth stage, about V4, V5, and we actually staged plants. And so those that were one growth stage behind their, their neighbor, we marked those plants. Plants that were two growth stages behind their neighbor, we marked those plants. And then we followed them through the season and checked out their final grain yield. And what we found was those that were one growth stage behind their neighbor lost 50% of their yield in our particular particular study. And then when they were two leaf stages behind their neighbor, they lost 78% of their yield compared to their neighbor. And so that's um, on an individual plant basis. So across the field, if you have a lot of that variability, you could see an overall impact on your final grain yield. And then the last image that we have to share with you today, um, just a couple of things to notice here um, in the background, you can see again, similar to what Allison was talking about earlier, we do have a large clod directly on top of this plant and it's expending energy growing around that plant, um, which was definitely not as likely in the ideal tillage uh, scenario. Um, and then actually in the forefront, you can see we have a plant that's completely twisted up. So you have large clods around it. It looks like there's actually residue on top of that plant, uh, potentially impeding its growth, and then certainly some poor seed to soil contact. And so unfortunately in this situation, it's not likely uh, that the plant will survive to harvest. And if it does, you're not going to have a viable ear from that plant. Very good. So there's what we're seeing at from a from an actual plant standpoint, right? We're at V2, V3 uh, leaf stages here. What do you think kind of is the end result of this at the end of the movie? Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, Allison. So what we did to get our yield predictions is we looked at stand loss 
whether it was 25 or 50% or more. So very heavy stand losses. We looked at that and we took away from our yield potential. And then we also looked at stand variability. So of the remaining plants, how many of them were one or two leaf stages behind? And we took a little more from that yield potential. And then that's how we landed on these yield uh, yield levels. And so here, this is showing you that we had the lowest yield potential coming from that poor seed bed with no um, engagement of those residue managers. And then the highest yield potential that we had was coming from that ideal, that good seed bed with the engagement of those residue managers. You bet. So that, as I would kind of expect, the poor seed bed, not using residue managers to move clods and try to quote unquote save you at that point, uh, obviously, it was going to be a, a, a real problem. The ideal gave us just a little bit more uh, a, a yield out of that. And then, of course, using residue managers there kind of saved us, but didn't quite do as good as having that ideal uh, with residue managers. Let me break this down just a little bit further for, for each one of these. You know, if you take away uh, and, and just focus solely on the seed bed itself and how that influences uh, the planter performance, uh, I think from our study, we've proven here especially with a 21 bushel an acre difference between a poor seedbed and an ideal one, at least in our studies, that, that need to make sure you're taking uh, that extra level of focus around that seedbed quality. And that can even start this fall. You're about to go to the field probably, uh, you know, doing some harvesting, doing corn, doing soybeans, then coming back this fall and, and doing some sort of fall pass, making sure that we're, we're, we're watching that closely. Settings are, are what they need to be. Ask help. Uh, if you need it, or maybe even look at something a little bit different, uh, a, a different Ecolo Tiger, a uh, different ver vertical tillage tool to help size clods and set the stage for next spring. And then when it comes to next spring, you know, making sure that we're, we're getting clods that are of this size, that might mean a new harrow uh, of some sort, right? And we're looking at a hundred, hundred bucks an acre, basically. So, you know, 10,000, 10,000 bucks over, you know, a thousand acres of corn pays for a harrow, all right? And over a couple of years, it pays for a new field cultivator, potentially, if you need to, to, to go that far, right? And be thinking about it in dollars and cents. How quickly is that going to pay back to me? All right, so let's look at the next study uh, that I broke down just from poor seedbed, the worst condition, all the way up to having the ideal and ideal. And that actually gives us that 29 and 30 bushel an acre advantage using residue managers, creating a, 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 an ideal seedbed. And, and I've had to make this decision myself, uh, actually on, especially around residue managers. When I bought a new planter, do I put them on there? Do I spend that several hundred dollars, thousand bucks, maybe even a row, depending on how much stuff is on it to, uh, to really, to, to, to use them. And I think most importantly, deciding on when to use them. Uh, and, and in most cases, it looks like we need to use them most of the time, right? To, in order to move clods aside and, and also take care of the residue that is there. Okay. So that's a picture of the surface. Right? And at Case IH, we don't just look at the surface, we go deeper. So let's talk about another kind of unseen and unforeseen area of the seedbed and, uh, and talk about seedbed floors and a technology that we have to help measure that. Allison, tell us a little more about the study you did on seedbed floors, that subsurface yes. that's created by soil management. So here, this is what we were trying to do is assess our, our seedbed sense technology. And so actually what we did is we took our 255 Tiger Mate, our field cultivator, and we had it equipped with seedbed sense. So what, what that's doing is it's assessing the amount of movement that the shank has. Um, and so when the sweep, if it's, if it's tripping, you're going to end up with a rougher floor that's being created by that cultivation. And so what we were trying to do is assess the impact of that on your planter and your final grain yield. So what we did is um, we took this 50 acre field. This is actually a screenshot from our portal. And this is showing you that 50 acre field. This is the soil map there for it. But what we did is we took that tiger mate and we ran across it. We did not make any adjustments. So you get feedback from those sensors, right? It tells you if it's good quality, it's going to be green. If it's moderate or if it's red, it's poor quality. So there's a lot of movement of that sweep. And so when it was going through, we didn't make adjustments. So if we saw a bunch of green, we didn't go faster, even though we probably could have. Um, we went ahead and kept it that way because we wanted to, to see how it would affect the planter. Because we went and we planted right into that, and we got to see how it was affecting the planter unit ride, how much movement there was 
for the planter. And then to further, we also got to see um, the final grain yield and how both the seedbed quality and the planter unit ride affected the final grain yield. And last to note that this was done, um, it was following no fall tillage. So just for this particular study, it's this 50 acre field and it didn't have fall tillage. And then we uh, utilized that field cultivator and soybean stubble. Right, so um, as we've been talking about seed bed, we actually have two uh, visual examples of seed bed. So we have a nice flat floor over here on the left hand side. And so if you can imagine from a planter perspective, those opener discs are gonna run nice and smooth along that floor. And so you're going to have very nice seed placement, as you can see in the image below, where you're going to have appropriately spaced seeds and seeds that are at the right depth. On the other side of things, we have an example of a rough floor, which might be a little bit hard to tell in this picture, um, but we do have a lot of hills and valleys that you're going to have to contend with. And so you'll have more of what you see in this image, right? So you might have seeds on top of hills or um, in those valleys. And so you're going to have a uh, potential variation in depth of those seeds. And so with that, you could have variation in your soil temperature or uh, your soil um, moisture or even your soil density. And so because of that, um, you're going to potentially have that uneven emergence that you're not really wanting, of course. Uh, then to go back to the opener discs again, um, as they're running along this floor, you're probably going to have a lot bumpier of a ride. So your row unit ride quality is really going to suffer here. And again, you're going to have issues with your spacing and your depth. Um, and again, thinking about speed as well, right? So obviously the faster that you're going, the more distance that you cover in a certain amount of time, right? So, so if your opener does hit a bump, it's going to be that much more distance is covered before they're able to settle down again and um, actually have that appropriate uh, spacing. This would have been with Delta Force, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the planters in all these examples are a fully decked out planter, Delta Force, Clean Sweep, all those pieces of it. Do you, you remember what the it setting was? It wasn't four. We'll show you the results in a second. It was there was it was always ninety percent or above, um, but there is differences. So it wasn't a four ride. No. So this. So, this so yeah. Um, so as you're talking about, you're gonna have uh, your opener just bouncing, and so again, we wanted to see how seed bed quality impacted our row unit ride. And so what we did is, as Allison described earlier, um, we took that tiger mate, kept the same settings from the beginning, regardless of the field condition um, or what we got as far as uh, feedback for the seed bed quality. And so what you can see is um, we have our poor seed bed quality, our moderate seed bed quality, and then our good seed bed quality. You can see those that data actually blocked over here in the red, yellow, and green in the map on the right hand side. And then we took our planter and we ran behind it and measured our row unit ride. And we actually took that data and layered it right on top of our tillage data. So then we were able to grab that data and actually see how did seedbed quality impact row unit ride? And then how did the two together impact our final grain yield? So hopefully this helps answer some of the questions that you have. So looking at the diagram on the left-hand side first, um, again, you can see our three different categories of seedbed reading are poor, uh, moderate, and good, and our row unit ride on the y-axis. And so what we saw actually was that uh, for each categorical increase in our seedbed quality, we saw a 2% increase in our row unit ride. And what was really awesome to see with this study was when we looked at our grain yield. So um, again, with our tillage seedbed quality on the bottom here, um, we saw that uh, going from a poor seedbed quality to a good seedbed quality, we actually improved our grain yield by 12 bushels per acre. And so essentially with each 2% increase in row unit ride, we had a uh, improvement of six bushels per acre. And again, that all comes back down to our seedbed. You bet. All right. So that's a that's you know this from here to here a, a red to yellow all right and increases by six and then another six if we were to able to uh, improve our overall ride quality of of the of the machine now that's a lot all right as a farmer I sit there and go really six you're actually going to do six or twelve in this case it seems like a lot so let's get a little bit more conservative about this say that just because we're able to create and know if that seabed has been created properly okay and it's and it's flat. You know, the planter is able to respond more quickly. You might even be able to drive faster, uh, both with fuel cultivator and the planter, or we know we got to slow down. Say we only got two out of it, all right? What does that actually look like? Well, remember, of 1,000 acres, you know, we get two more semi-loads of corn out of that. Okay, it's only two. It's all, it's all I'm going to just cut that down by a third. 
multiply that times four, which of course, you know, today we're, we're a little higher than that if we, if we were to market it all, but I assume that over the last year, you know, that's probably somewhere closer to the average. So another eight grand, we actually cost a, a charge about $4,500 for that system to be able to tell you a little bit more about what's happening with your tillage. All right, give you a little bit more uh, peek inside of that seedbed floor and that piece that may not be uh, understood very much and it may not be, may be affecting you more than you think. All right. With that, let's talk about kind of the, the next piece and advancement in technology. And, uh, you know, I think as we, we look at our fields, as I go out and look at my fields this fall, uh, everybody makes a, a conscious choice about what you're going to do to those fields. Uh, it's going to be treated either as a conventional type field. Uh, right, we're going to go rip it, and then in the, in the spring, maybe we're going to come back field cultivated. Or you're going to go more of a conventional practice, where you're going to you know, use maybe a vertical tillage tool to size residue, just get those mixed in, uh, particles mixed in, and begin that breakdown process, so we come back maybe in the spring and do it again. Or, of course, no-till. And you peanut butter spread this all the way across all the fields. Uh, and you're making these choices maybe on a side hill of a field, maybe, that, uh, that is highly erodible. Meanwhile, in the bottoms, they could actually benefit. And, and have a little bit difference uh, or make a difference in your ending yield. So we're gonna farm for one conditioner, or we could farm for them all. And here's maybe an example where a farm actually in Ohio, and we'll use this gentleman, uh, Doug Radcliffe, as, as a kind of our example here, where he used prescriptions uh, in a field. And what I'm really talking about here is prescribing and actually being able to uh, identify settings for a tool for the ex exact area of the field to match its needs. Right, so we have a dark soils and we have uh, maybe some rocks here that I don't want to touch. I'm from Butler County, Iowa. Uh, we, we have rocks the size of Volkswagens buried in the ground. We really don't want to touch those because there's a lot of labor in picking them up uh, at this point. And uh, we want to maybe go around them more. It's highly erodible. And we just want to totally uh, avoid that area uh, or have a zero setting and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about some of the studies we've done around prescriptive tillage, right? We do this for seed. We do this for fertilizer now a lot. At least I, I do a lot of that now uh, to prescribe the amount of phosphorus or potassium for an area. What's some of the, the, the studies we've done around yeah. prescriptive tillage mm -hmm. uh, in that similar so fashion? We, we have done a couple of studies. Um, and the first one that we're going to focus in on is more for the conservation tillage type. We utilize our 335 BT. And in certain areas, as he mentioned, there's going to be those more highly erodible areas. And so we were able to run at different depths with our prescription for different management zones to, to be able to uh, get, get through that. So this is our example. We went to Wisconsin and we were creating different management zones. So, so with, these, with these different management zones, you can decide as a farmer, you know different areas of your field the best, right? So you can have obviously what you want to do just because of that. You can also have a layer in there from your topography. If you know something is sloping, you, you're gonna want to potentially conserve all that residue in that particular area. And that's where you could, instead of running at two and a half inches to really incorporate residue, you wanna just run at zero and maintain it. And that's what we were doing here actually. Um, in certain areas, we actually ran at zero and in that situation, we did have this standing um, wheat stubble, <laughs> wheat stubble, and we were running at zero. So you're going across it. And so your stock or stubble is vertical. You're actually knocking it down and increasing the amount of residue coverage that is there in the areas that you want to maintain it. And then in other areas where you have different soil management zones, those areas that are lower risk of erosion, that you actually maybe you had higher yields, which we know results in more residue that needs to be managed at the um, at harvest time. Mm -hmm. And so in those situations, maybe you wanted to be more aggressive and run at the two and a half inch depth and do more incorporating. And that's what we did. And we saw that we were reducing the residue coverage there. And then uh, just to bounce back to planters really quickly, because everybody loves planters, right? Most important uh, implement. <laughs> Most important. Um, so as Allison was describing, in some locations, we really didn't want to have any tillage, um, pretty much. And so we actually laid down that residue and increased the residue coverage in those areas. And, you know, she's absolutely right. We want to have that armor on the soil, uh, protect it from that raindrop impact that could potentially accelerate erosion issues. 
Um, but when it comes time to planting uh, and we're about to drop that seed in the furrow, we want to have uh, that residue moved aside to really give that seed the best chance at uh, emerging successfully. And so this is where we can bring it back to uh, residue managers. This would be a good time to actually have those residue managers and engage them so that uh, you can create that environment for the seed and where they could potentially make a difference when it comes to yield at the end of the day. All right, so very conservation type practice and really from a farmer perspective, just a whole different way to think, right? Uh, I'm actually gonna consciously go to a field with a tillage tool and not use it in certain areas. Right? That's, that's the kind of key here. You're going to be at zero depth. And this was fascinating. I was in this field, and I, we, we actually saw an increase in residue cover by going to zero depth. So for that conservation practice, it, it was it was very effective. And in fact, when we got to that one and a half, I, what I saw is that we didn't actually break all the surface compaction either. So for that side hill, you know, the washing I think would be really minimized out of that. But yet we were able to manage and actually remove a few weeds. And then of course in that high yielding area, as you said. Uh, be able to manage and actually uh, mix in that residue to, from the high, higher yields. So that's the agronomic perspective. Let's talk a little bit about productivity when, and how that relates to the prescriptive and tillage. For this, we were focusing more on the conservation side, trying to maintain residue where we needed it. And then the next study, we went to North Carolina and we were utilizing our Ecolo Tiger 875 disc ripper. And so that particular tool, we're trying to utilize that to set that shank an inch below a compaction layer and try to knock it out and alleviate compaction. So the next prescriptions that we were doing, uh, we were actually, uh, we were working with several different farmers in North Carolina, and we, we, we had five different fields, about 200 acres, and we created very uh, precise prescriptions for each field. Basically, we wanted to be able to run the minimum depth with that disc ripper, but still knock out the compaction. Okay, so we had very um, distinct soil management zones, and we created these prescriptions for all five of those fields, and then we went in and we cut that in half. So this is showing you an example of that. This side, we had that varying prescription and we ranged from five to 14 inches in depth for that. And then on the other side, we actually ran a constant depth. So we just ran at 14 inches based off of recommendations from the farmers for that particular area, okay? And so one half, it was varying and we were trying to be as efficient as possible. And then the other side was that peanut butter spread. So those five different fields, those five different customized prescriptions, what we saw um, across all of them. This was showing you an as applied file. So you get this feedback immediately um, um, as you're going through the field and then it maps it out so you can look at it later. But this is showing you that varying depth, the five to 14 inches. And then on the other side of this field, we ran that constant depth. And so across those five fields, what we saw was that nine and a half percent improvement in our productivity when we were utilizing that prescription. All right. So from a, from a, a ripping and, and that fall tillage aspect, a lot of time it takes to do it. And that's, that's kind of one of the knocks that you sometimes get with fall tillage. It takes a long time to do and it's, it's labor intensive. And in this case, we're seeing it, at least in this instance in North Carolina, running very deep, actually, if, if you ask me. But, uh, but it's what they wanted to do. We, we increased and improved by an acre an hour, right? And that could pull us back, what, a couple days maybe at the end of this whole thing where we have the opportunity to either keep going before the frost comes in in northern climates uh, or go do something else more productive uh, or, or whatever, just saving us time and resources. And if we're able to, if we have more time and we can get to those last few acres that you know have, have known compaction yeah. and you can have this method of actually trying to alleviate it and hit it with... Um, with the ripper, you can improve your, your yield because uh, as we know, uh, compaction itself can reduce your yield from 10 to 20%. And some research studies actually show clear up to 50%, depending on the severity of your compaction. So being able to get to more acres is very, very helpful for your bottom line. You bet, you bet. So let's uh, let's talk about kind of some other examples or at least the, this, uh, this cooperator we work with out in Ohio. and. This farmer we worked with there was uh, heavy into conservation tillage, and uh, Doug was his name, Doug Ratcliffe. That was the, the triangular field shape that I was showing you earlier, uh, and, and really had no intentions of ripping or, or using a ripper in this field, but he knew actually it could benefit him, but he wasn't doing anything about it because just fearful of the damage it would cause uh, from, from the entire field perspective. So, But he said, in this case, we needed this 30 years ago, 
I would have not allowed a disc ripper in this field if it were not capable of on-the-go adjustment and prescriptive technology because the compaction and correcting pH and specifically compaction have been the biggest challenges. Those two are actually kind of related at the end, but, uh, but restricting that root development, right, that compaction and getting that 10 to 20 bushels an acre. So let's look at a kind of an example here uh, as well as the kind of an ROI perspective maybe that he might have been seeing where, where in areas of this whole field, maybe say it was 100 acres, weren't able to touch it and, and you were seeing all right, I'm, I'm going pretty heavy here, but 250 on an average, okay? And, and saying that he was gonna, gonna reach that on until. But because maybe 70 acres of this, we could actually make and, and benefit it. Maybe two thirds of that, that field or just over it could benefit from some sort of management. But we leave the other parts all alone, right? We go to zero or we, don't, we do minimum amounts. And we just increase those little areas, that area of 70 acres by 10 because of, well, that's a little conservative from that 10 to 20% increase we could see by removing compaction. I know it's small maybe, but 700 bushels is 700 bushels, another semi load out of that field, and end of, you know, 1,700 bucks uh, kind of back at us if we can actually, that's removing all the costs too for, for ripping. So just that next, everybody's looking for that next step. And, and here's one of those possible next steps that we can actually be taking. So how is he gonna do this? How does this actually work with prescription? Because this is a really big thought, thought process, really thought changing a little bit. And, and it obviously takes a couple things. One is you gotta have an implement with, that it can have active control on it. So soil command, for example, our 875 over here, the Tiger Mate has it. 875 running in the field also is utilizing the system. Software to create it, and that's our AFS Connect platform that's seen in the building uh, with the big Case IH logo right over there. Uh, you can see it, you can, you can build them, create them all there. You pull all your soil maps down just like this picture, create prescriptions from that because that's the next thing is the knowledge and the guidance. How do you do it? What do you base this all on? Well, one is your own knowledge. I know I'm talking to folks on, this, on, the, on the site the last three days, you know, they know their fields. Like I know I don't want to do something here and I know I want to do something here. You can create any polygon shape you want in the field and, and, and circle things and go around things. You can write hi mom in the field if you would like. It doesn't really matter. You can create anything you'd like. You can also base it off of soil types and topography, which we've all done. We, we've done all of these things. Uh, you can base it off of yield, which is going to be directly related to your residue levels. So all those pieces can be created uh, and, and utilized to create uh, those management zones for prescriptive tillage technology. All right. So this is a recap here. Uh, I, I really want to, uh, to thank everybody for your attention and Al Dr. Allison and, and Lily. Uh, with the research that we've done over the last year with tillage quality uh, and how that relates to the planter settings and actual planter performance and, and yield, uh, because we could see there's a big difference. And, and we got to be thinking as we're heading to the field this fall, watch clod sizing, watch settings of your tools and utilize that soil command technology if you have it to, uh, to really improve that, bring back that ROI. And then, of course, be thinking, changing your thought process around prescriptions and tillage technology. Uh, it might take a little bit of time to kind of get us all into it, but, but you, can, you can actually see some benefit from utilizing it. With that, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of Farm Progress Show 2021 for the next few hours as we close this down. And uh, thank you everyone and, and be safe out there this fall. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>